This is Electric Universe Eyes, and today I wanted to share with you what I received on my birthday, uh, which was the end of March. So I have a really awesome wife, and she got me this Zeus statue, which is amazing. What the eagle on his shoulder represents is the planet Mercury. And of course, he's got his amazing Thunderbolt. I got this really cool card here, and it says, Congrats, you went 41 times around the sun. It's really awesome. You're out of this world. Thank you guys, you're amazing. <laughs> My daughter's awesome. My wife is the best. Adds nicely to my set of deities here from across the world. Lastly, I wanted to show you this book I got. So I'm really happy to also receive a book I've been wanting to get called God Star by the late Duardo Cardona. And in this book, I wanted to show you what I found inside. I think a lot of you will appreciate this. Check it out. It's Wallace Thornhill, photographed in 1995. By the author. So I'm going to narrate the beginning of the first chapter, but I want to read the back for you first. If controversial subjects are not your cup of tea, read no further and put this book down right now because what this work has to offer is revolutionary in the extreme. Godstar sets out to show that the sky which ancient man remembers entirely different from the one that now stretches above us. This demonstrated through ancient texts from all over the world which deal with the astronomical lore of our forebears. As if with a single voice, these texts proclaim that the present planet we know as Saturn once shone as a sun in Earth's primordial sky. This claim receives credence through the fact that astronomers now view the planet Saturn as the remnant of what had once been a brown dwarf star. It also goes a long way in explaining why Saturn was considered the ruler of the planets in mythology, and why the god of that planet is found at the head of every ancient pantheon on Earth. Astronomically, it is then deduced that Earth used to be the satellite of this proto-Saturnian sun, which mini-system then invaded the present solar system, and that this transpired during the Age of Man. As bizarre as this scenario appears, it has lent credibility by the hard sciences through the unmistakable signs encountered here on Earth, as also by what is constantly being discovered out in space. In fact, the likelihood that such an interloping planetary system might have been captured by the sun is even more now acknowledged by a new class of trailblazing astronomers. Thus, apart from the mytho-historical record, the theory presented within the pages of this book includes evidence from geology, paleontology, astrophysics, and plasma cosmology. It also serves to elucidate various dilemmas that presently encumber these and other disciplines. What might be seen by some as of greater importance, the reconstruction of the primeval events that took place beneath the proto-Saturnian sun goes a long way in disclosing the origins of religion, including the very concept of deity. While for the sake of scholarship, the book includes the odd technical tract it is nevertheless written in a manner that will be readily understood by the intelligent layperson. In fact, it almost reads like a detective novel. Published by Tellwell. So let's read the first section of chapter one. First and foremost, I wish to thank my wife, Galia, not only for her help in researching, but also for the patience and understanding she displayed during the years that went into this work. And here are all the acknowledgments. I see a lot of Electric Universe folks in here. And the contents. Ruler of the planets in mythology and why the god of that planet is found at the head of every ancient pantheon on Earth. Astronomically, it is then deduced that Earth used to be the satellite of this proto-Saturnian sun, which mini-system then invaded... Well, I've got a lot of reading to do. Again, I can't read you the whole book. Other than as specified above and in the text itself, I burden no one with each and every single facet of the theory presented in this work. Chapter 1 Myths and Legends. 
The first criticism that will be leveled at this work is that it is based on nothing but myths and legends. I agree, it is. It is also based on recent discoveries in astronomy, geology, and paleontology. Even so, what are myths and legends? Strictly speaking, legends are traditional tales popularly regarded as historical myths. But then what are myths? Myths are usually defined as primitive or ancient tales involving supernatural beings, often embodying once popular ideas concerning natural and historical phenomena. What then is the difference between myths and legends? There will be some who will claim that there is no difference. Others may make a distinction between mythic tales told about historical persons, legends, and mythic tales told about divine and semi-divine beings, mythology. Personally, I would make a further distinction in that mythology deals mostly with cosmogonical origins. But let us not get caught up in semantics. Let me simply say that, in this work, I shall be concentrating on those tales dealing with divine and semi-divine beings. One claim I shall, however, be making is that these tales are not mythic in the usually understood sense of the word. In other words, what I shall be claiming is that the tales I shall be treating of are not to be considered untrue. On the contrary, I hope to show beyond a reasonable doubt that these tales truly reflect events that, bizarre though they might seem, actually transpired in ages past. Franz Xavier Kugler, one of the world's foremost authorities on Babylonian and biblical astronomy, chronology, and mythology, who died in 1929, warned that, quote, Ancient traditions, even when they are dressed as myth and saga, cannot be dismissed lightly as fantastic, or worse, meaningless fabrications. It is particularly proper to avoid this pitfall when dealing with serious reports, especially those of a religious nature, such as those that occur in large number in the Old Testament." End quote. In this work, the word mythology is used in its original Greek meaning, mythologia, from mythos or mythos, as pronounced by the Athenians, meaning tale, and logia, derived from legin, or to speak, that is, the telling of tales. There is nothing in the Greek term itself which specifies that these tales were considered fictional. More than that, it were these very tales that formed the basis of Greek and other religions of the ancient world. True, it shall be countered that these ancient religions were based on false premises. What I aim to indicate, on the other hand, is that these premises were anything but false. One may now ask, what actually constitutes mythos? As Roger Westcott explained, linguistic comparison suggests that the Greek word muthos is derived from a proto-Indo-European stem, which means to remember nostalgically and or to pine for. And as I shall also endeavor to show, the contents of the world's mythology indicates exactly that, a sorrowful longing for the conditions of a past age. Thus Westcott was inclined to state that he viewed myth, quote, as more wistful than wishful, end quote, besides being, quote, more commemorative than imaginative, end quote. Those who are familiar with the contents of myth, even if only cursorily, will at once point out that myths are too convoluted in their bewildering messages, when not perplexingly contradictory, to be taken seriously in this day and age. But as Claude Levi Strauss admonished, quote, this apparent arbitrariness is belied by the astounding similarity among myths collected in widely different regions, end quote. Or as Westcott succinctly phrased it, quote, myths are at once startlingly bizarre and oppressively repetitious, end quote. For Alan Watts, the prime paradox was that myth conceals while it simultaneously reveals. And that's what I have for you today. I had a wonderful birthday and I love my wife and my children and all my family and friends. And if you're out there listening to this right now, I may not know you in person, but somehow we're connecting. And I hope one day we can be friends. And I want to close this out with saying, I wish the best for everyone here. And I hope that you're all healthy and we take this moment in life to realize what's important to us. And it's unlocking these mysteries with real knowledge and sharing them with the ones that we love the most and actually taking the time to share 
with those ones we love the most, the ones that we might just be too afraid to talk to because of our own egos. I'm 41 now, and uh, I wanted to say that because for the first time in my life, I've been able to truly be myself this year to the ones that I love the most, that I've been pushing away the most, and that's my immediate family. So if you have family or friends that you care about, but they don't know that you really do, I think right now is the time to reach out. All right, be well, friends.